In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, You who are everywhere present and fill all things, Treasury of all that is good and Master of life, Come, dwell within us, Cleanse us from all stain, And save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to continue now with the same theme of assessing the environment in which we are called to preach and to help our people. We're going on with this first, uh, we're in paragraph 20 now, of the document, the Gaudium et Spes. Not to be overlooked among the forms of modern atheism is that which anticipates the liberation of man, especially through his economic and social emancipation. emancipation. Freedom! See, it's been the, the rich who kept the poor down, and they did it all in the name of religion. And now we throw that off, as we get to that in a more atheistic way soon, and uh, uh, we have to claim this world is ours. Underlying that is an incredible pride. There's two kinds of this pride. One is There are a lot of poor out there, and I'm going to liberate them, and I'll be the Savior. Look at those who have done the most for the poor. How many of them are canonized saints? They're not filled with being a Savior. They're filled with serving the Savior and revealing his face to those who are poor. Uh, You remember that saying, that I quoted, I think, the first time from that book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, where he says, look, in every revolution, the uh, oppressors become the oppressed, and the oppressed become the oppressors, but nothing changes. That's not progress. You see? All right, now, um, this form, that of liberation of man And so, through economic and uh, social emancipation, this form argues that by its nature, religion thwarts this liberation by arousing man's hope for a deceptive future life, thereby diverting him from the constructing of the earthly city. Now, can people do that? I mean, be so hyper-pious? I mean, there have been scandalous examples of this in Russia in Latin America, probably here too in America, where the rich just go on and they never care for the poor. And, uh, you see, uh, and so getting all these people excited about something in the future, they should go back to work. Now, what's the antidote to that? Prayer. Because if you're praying you're going to get over the illusion that you're at the center of the universe and that this whole universe is designed to serve you. And you had better start taking care of all the others around you. Um, Consequently, when the proponents of this doctrine gain governmental power, they vigorously fight against religion, sound familiar? And promote atheism by using, especially in the education of youth, those means of pressure which public power has at its disposal. Now, that doesn't mean that every government agency is run by the devil, but it does mean that under it, and unknown to them, is this spirit of total rebellion, trying to get humankind to adjoin it. You see, don't worry. I mean, this illusion you're going to be with God forever. Get here and now. And uh, that inspires a terrifying pride. Terrifying. Uh, And excuses anything that I want to do to improve the social situation the way I want it improved so that everybody will recognize that I'm its savior. And whatever I have to do to achieve that goal is legitimate, including murdering, as I pointed out before, you know. Uh, Hitler, 6 million, Stalin, 10 million, 
well, let's say, to a hundred million people. It's justified because of the great future that I have, you see, in store for these people. In her loyal devotion to God and men, the Church has already repudiated and cannot cease repudiating sorrowfully, sorrowfully, but as firmly as possible, those poisonous doctrines and actions which contradict reason and the common experience of humanity and dethrone man from his native excellence. What does the preacher do with that kind of a statement? He has to, in non-scholarly way, appeal to reason. Do you think all this happened by a chance? You know, and it, it, if it is created by God, we are responsible to God, and our decisions are responsible to God. You see? And therefore, and among those decisions are how we care for those who need help. Uh, so, uh, still the church strives to detect in the atheistic mind the hidden causes for the denial of God. Conscious of how weighty are the questions which atheism raises, and motivated by love for all men, she believes these questions ought to be examined seriously and more profoundly. Now. How does that apply to the preacher? First, recognize the incessant propaganda of the whole culture. And if you want to believe in God, that's your business. Go right ahead. But keep it off the public square. Remember uh, Richard Newhouse's book, The Naked Public Square. Huh? The public square is stripped bare of any relationship to God. And that's been a triumph. Okay. Now, the Church holds that the recognition of God is in no way hostile to man's dignity, since this dignity is rooted and perfected in God. What does that mean? Well, let's take an example. St. Francis. He let him, I think it was he let him out of prison up there in Perugia, and he's walking home, and there's this leper comes to ask for stuff. The leper is standing right in front of him. He gives him something if he has it, and he gives him a big hug. And he moves on. That night, in a dream, Francis saw that leper. It was Christ. That's how we preach. That's how we act. Everybody we meet, you know, is Christ. I was hungry and you fed me. You know, uh, I was embarrassed and you ignored me. See what I mean? It's Christ. So, without appealing to sentiment, but simple, practical ways, and then making them available for people, uh, and making sure that our people don't take pride in their benevolence. Because uh, while it might help some people a bit, it ruins the whole thing. But we have to get that sense of love and respect and pray to the great saints who. Like um, Mother Cabrini here in this country, uh, Padre Pio, and others, certainly Mother Teresa. The Church holds that the recognition of God is in no way hostile to man's dignity. How? Uh, uh, you see what I'm doing? I'm trying to pry, pry all these beautiful teachings to what we have to do when we're preaching. Preaching in adversity. Huh? The adversity is this strong, militant atheism and the enormous world of benign neglect. Don't pay us any attention at all. Well, you know, if you're like that and you want to help out people, go right ahead. But uh, i got other things to do. And, you know, you console them, let them think about God. It might make their life nicer, but then we know there is no God. How do we preach in that environment? How do we help our own people have a firm grasp of what's going on? Well, this is one way. The other way? Take our Lord's teaching on social action. I was hungry and you fed me. I was in jail and you visited me. I was sick and you came to see me. We never saw you. What you did to the least of my brethren, all the brethren, the, the, uh, the atheists too, 
poor atheists, you know, but Hindu, Muslim, everybody. They're my brothers and sisters. And if you're doing stuff for them, you're doing it for me. And you'll be in for a great surprise when you die if you're trying just to respect everybody. I've lived, I think I mentioned this before, this was a great dilemma for me when I was living in almost immediately post-World War II Rome, but the poverty was. And the number of these little Vespa, these little motorcycles, repaired to the number of cars, it was exactly the inverse we see now. If you go over to Rome now, these little Fiats and these cars and the buses are all buzzing around. And a few people are still on their motorcycles, these Vespas. When I first lived there in the 50s, whatever it was, 56 maybe? Uh, no, 54. Anyway, in there. It was exactly the opposite. Everybody, even businessmen, everybody was riding on a, on a Vespa because Everybody was so poor. Well, if everybody's poor, what are the poor like? Uh, I used to visit uh, a woman sick of tuberculosis, which was rampant in those days. She had a child, one child. She could never hold that child. Her husband would come and stand at the hospital door and let her look at the child. And finally, Maria died. And then they brought her home and laid her out on the bed. And I went over to the house of the apartments, Paul apartment. These are poor people. And she had a sister, Elena, I think her name was. So there's Maria lying dead on the bed, emaciated tuberculosis, you know. And, and the, the other one, Elena, says to me, Padre, perque? Father, why? I looked at her and said, listen, Elena, you're older than I am and you've suffered more than I have. I, I can't answer that question. She said, grazie. A no answer was a better answer than a made-up answer. At least I could stand with her in the poverty of not knowing, except I trust God, and he's going to take care of Maria. So, uh, the recognition of God is in no way hostile to man's dignity. No real believing leader ever murdered a hundred million people. That's for sure. For man was made an intelligent and free member of a society by God, who created him. But even more important, he is called as a son to commune with God and share in his happiness. The church further teaches that a hope is related at the end of time does not diminish the importance of intervening duties, but rather undergirds the acquittal of them with fresh incentive. When I lived in Rome, when I was working with the, uh, Maria and Elaine and all these people, it was because on our day off, which was Thursday in, this, in Rome, I got tired of looking at old stones when I saw all this poverty. So I went to the general and I said, I'd like to go help the poor. And of course, I had no money at all. The general gave me money and he said, but I want you to work with sister so-and-so. I thought, that's great. I don't know anything about this. And so I worked with a French sister who guided me. And I went to visit people. Now, I didn't change the social structure of Rome. But I did show love to people who were suffering. And I know the Lord wanted that. So, that's as far as we're going to get in this talk. We'll have one more on this topic.